All right, folks, welcome to Nino's Corner.tv. This is Fluff Tube Edition. Priced Spiracy. Priced Conspiracy. It's the Christ Conspiracy that everyone's talking about right now, and I'm privileged enough to have Cameron Waters on my my show to talk about this and i gotta say uh we were talking about we were talking about this before we went on and i got into in the introduction from juan uh and i and i'm i'm privileged to have you on this is crazy so this is a documentary revealing a 2000 year cover-up what's the cover-up what are we what are we looking at here and i know that's a loaded question but really what well, is let me, it? let me start you out here nino let me let me just let me let me start you out here nino because i think people um might be thrown off by some of what uh, is presented here. Let me just say this first. I'm a super fan of what Cameron has done in, in his movie here. And uh, uh, it goes back, I've talked about it even with your audience, you know, where Christ uh, got actually visibly pissed off and made a whip and then... Uh, uh, overturned all the money changers tables at the temple. And this is in the last week of Christ's life uh, uh, before the uh, crucifixion. So there was high drama that was taking place. And uh, uh, it's, it's one of those things where people have not really fully understood this, but uh, Cameron, uh, his grandfather and mom both do ministry stuff. He grew up in a, in a, uh, believing household and he had some questions and this movie is the culmination of kind of a world tour that he's done to kind of find himself find some answers to some questions that he had that probably a lot of us do but it's going to take you places that i don't think any other um church group or christian operation has done well in many hundreds of years as this christ spiracy he will cause you to have to think about some questions that he raises and and rethink your uh perspective and faith and uh it's gonna be a hard one for a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow um and the the short circuit or to skip right straight to the the point um the question is, was Christ a vegan? Um, and uh, were some of the apostles then, of course, uh, come into that same category over time? So uh, Cameron's come up with some very straight answers that uh, so I, I don't want to need the, your reaction. That's the meat and potatoes of this, <laughs> is if Christ yeah. was... If Christ was vegan, that's that's really what this conspiracy is. Well, but let me let me add this too before I get people turning this off. I want I want look. I think I've uh, you know with the audience that we have, you know, I always try to be uh, give you the details behind why I'm saying what I'm saying. What what is um, the the data, the information that I'm basing what I'm saying on? and uh, try to walk you through it. It's a longer conversation most of the time than, than other folks will have with, with your guests. Um, I will say this, so I'm not vegan, and I, uh, you know, have had to think very hard. Uh, what Cameron's done is, is uh, uh, something that I've had to, uh, I'm getting nuts here in Vegas, uh, I've had to really do some stretching as I look through what Cameron's put together. Part of the reason this is relevant, whether you want to go this route or not, is because a lot of the questions that he raises go even to world events right now. Uh, we have the red heifer story that's in here. Uh, and Cameron's one of the people that's actually interviewed the, interviewed, uh, the people that uh, raised the ref, red heifer coming out of Texas knows the people in Israel that have uh, some of these uh, uh, secreted away there. And there's a question whether or not uh, some of the Hamas people who uh, started this attack on Israel last October stated that this uh, issue about the restarting of the sacrifices on the Temple Mount was what caused that, uh, was, was the thing that initiated that. So this subject is something that we 
as a group, uh, all of the people that you and I talk with, you know, within this, you know, community need to slow down and at least look at and consider. And the uh, movie that Cameron has put together, you will not have wasted one second going to it. And I'm, I'm just going to ask as a courtesy that, you know, I think everybody in our audience, uh, if you want to understand world events somewhat and, and at least get stretched in your way of thinking, this is a worthwhile uh, thing to do. Cameron put, you know, real uh, blood, sweat, and tears into this. In fact, this was this was uh, originally supposed to be a Netflix movie, and uh, they wanted to tone it down, edit stuff out, and Cameron and the people that put it together decided that that, that just couldn't work. They had to go out and crowdfund to buy back the rights from Netflix. And I'm not throwing any stones at Netflix. I, you know, they do a lot of great stuff. They had the insight to do it in the first place. And they had a thing in the contract that allowed them, uh, you know, if they didn't see it the same way at the end when it was done, to buy it out. Netflix, you know, made a buck and like that. So they get credit for even considering broaching this subject. And uh, this, but this Cameron is, and the guys have theaters. gone further. This is going to be in theaters when in in uh, March twentieth. In days, in days, you know, and it's there twice. And the reason I want to I want to slow down for a second here is because it's not just going to be in theaters for weeks and weeks. You got two days that are scheduled right now. If enough people come and see it, they'll play it longer and they'll extend the dates. But it's in six hundred fifty theaters right now worldwide. So you got to go online and find out what the theaters are that are closest to where your people are, are at. But I'm just telling you, I wasn't that excited about it. Uh, we had a mutual friend uh, over a year ago that asked uh, me to meet with Cameron, and I did. And it was uh, a unexpectedly refreshing and enjoyable meeting. I, Cameron, you're one of the... Uh, I, I, I enjoy people where I have to think, and they give me material where i actually have to sift through it uh the stuff that we talked about your presentations and your um uh working through how you came to your conclusions including the the material uh you did as good as anybody could have and i think took me places that i would not otherwise have gone if it had been anybody else but you we wouldn't have had those conversations um and so i just want to give a, a big hat tip to you uh cameron for all the work that you've done and within our audience, Nino, I'm just asking everybody, take a deep breath. It'll be worth your time. You'll actually enjoy this. And for other reasons, even if you aren't going to go become a vegan, the concerns we have about our food supply uh, and some of the issues that you raise here in what you're doing, Cameron, uh, every person in this audience needs to be aware of because we are all affected by some of these issues uh, very directly. It's not going away. And uh, so with that in mind, I mean, I want to kind of hand it over to you. I just, I yeah, want yeah, to take, sure to take, take a, a minute. minute. I want to take a minute and make sure that people really, really slow down. No knee, re knee jerk reactions. I, I, I know how I looked at it and it was a very worthwhile endeavor. I enjoyed it. And you raised some, some important issues that we as a group need to understand, including for world political uh, situation especially out of the Mideast and like that. So uh, that, that cover mm -hmm. camera, that, that kind of hit it for you? Yeah, that's great. I mean, you went straight for the jugular with the, the <laughs> vegan the vegan side. But, uh, yeah, but, but, I, well, but well, it's, it's actually something more. It, there is, let me just add this. Okay. Within the church community, uh, uh, including, by the way, Jews and Muslims, there is serious uh, questions about what we are getting in the uh, scriptures. People ask me all the time, are we missing books of the Bible? Has stuff been altered? Some of the work that uh, I look forward to doing with you, uh, Cameron, later this year, uh, maybe in Europe and over in Israel, goes to some of that material, which has been either altered or uh, hidden. And I think there's some amazing and very serious discussions that have to be had uh, concerning uh, some of that. And, and there's a cross-reference. You know, I, I look at the numbers behind things, including the hidden uh, Bible codes, things like that. So there's, there's other ways of looking at it than just what it says and what's written precisely. 
and I want to bring some of that to it. But as, as far as the, some, a subject matter that's critical that we need to understand with the events in the Mideast, yeah. uh, think of the drama that happened when Christ overturned the money changers tables right before the Passover, uh, uh, you know, date and that people were preparing for it. And then think about this, these events happening in the Middle East right before they uh, claim that they're getting ready to begin the sacrifices again on the Temple Mount and the reverberations out into the world. Your work here is here for a reason at exactly this time. And I want people to slow down and look at it from other directions, whether you intend to change your diet or not, you're going to find things that have overtones into what's happening in the world right now. And that's why I think there's a hand of God behind you doing this work exactly as you did. And you asked honest questions and sought out answers, uh, places I would never have even thought to go. And I think your, your whole journey here is a hand of God thing. And so big hat tip to you, uh, Cameron. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Go. All right, Cameron, let's get started. One, I appreciate the introduction, man. Thank you. Yes, of course. Cameron. All right. So you come from a family of preachers. Do I have that right? Yeah, yeah. My grandfather was a music minister. Um, he's founded many churches. He was a part of the Jesus movement. I don't know if you saw or heard in the rumblings with the same spheres as like The Chosen and uh, Sound of Freedom. There was a film that came out last year called Jesus Revolution about all the hippies in the 70s that came to Christ. My grandfather was heavily, heavily involved in that movement in the South, uh, in the Southern Baptist kind of sector of that. Um, and he founded, uh, you know, as a part of founding a, a really important church at that time. And um, then from there, my mom, she was a music minister, worship leader all my whole life growing up. Um, and so therefore I followed that same path when I started taking my faith really seriously, when you can kind of comprehend it at a certain level, you know, at 17, 18 years old, I committed my life to, yeah, uh, gospel music in particular, and was a professional gospel musician for most of my twenties, um, until, you know, some of these questions started burning and some of the things started again, coming into my life that, I would have never, never planned to come into my life. It was something that, again, you know, I do appreciate what Juan says and that there it feels as if there's some divine orchestration or some things that have just happened that, you know, I couldn't avoid. I had to ask these questions. I had to go down this path and uh, it's led me to this point. Um, and just too, because, you know, he went straight into the into the vegan thing, which I appreciate just getting that out on the table. We'll talk about that more. It definitely is too, you know, before even getting to that conversation, it's like you said, it's about the historical event of Palm Sunday, which we're coming up on. Um, so the timing is impeccable. Again, not planned. It's just the way that this all happened. We happen to get the ability to distribute this in theaters. We've been struggling trying to figure out how to get this out because it truly has been something that, uh, let's just say there's been some suppression. There's been some, some, some forces that have been trying to not, you know, well, uh, let's, let's talk about that yeah. first. You say suppression. So I heard this was originally supposed to appear on Netflix, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. So uh, I don't know if your screen is live right now. I think it is, but you see, it says from the co-creative Cowspiracy, that's not me. That's my co-director of this film, uh, Kip Anderson. He created Cowspiracy, What the Health, and Seaspiracy. They're all films that are licensed. Well, the first two are licensed on Netflix. Seaspiracy was a Netflix original. Uh, all of them look at animal agriculture from various facets. Now, just so everyone is aware, because you know, I know you probably have a lot of truthers and people that listen to your podcast. I'm one of those. A I lot of meat eaters. A lot of meat eaters. I, and, I'm and, one and, of them. <laughs> and a lot of those too. And now, trust me, I'm in the same boat. I'm a truther through and through in every way. I go deep on the conspiracies. Uh, it's kind of, I mean, it's Christspiracy for goodness sake. You know, is the name of the film. But, um, but basically, I come from a background. You know, not only was my family music ministers and deeply involved with the church. I was a hunter. I grew up going to a Christian youth hunting club. Um, I was a deep sea fisherman every year, multiple times a year, 40 miles offshore, catching grouper, snapper, the whole thing. Um, I worked at a barbecue restaurant my entire, uh, that was one of my first oh my jobs because my, my stepdad is, uh, at the time was a, uh, 
owner of a restaurant, a barbecue restaurant. So uh, I cut barbecue <laughs> my my teenage years and everything. So I'm the least likely person to uh, stumble into this. But just so everybody's aware, I wasn't. I had nothing to do with Cowspiracy, um, nor what the health. I met Kip when he was at a screening for Cowspiracy, um, and he was just about to release What the Health uh, on Netflix because he got Netflix licensed it. That was when I met him. And the only reason that we met, again, it was a synchronicity. I was at a, an event in LA that I was working. I had to, uh, at the time, I was transitioning out of being a gospel musician and realizing that these burning questions were going to take me down a different path. I was thinking about writing a book on it. So, and then so I let me ask you about these burning questions, because I think we all have burning questions, especially when it mm -hmm. comes to something so polarizing as Christianity or Jesus Christ. Um, I have questions. Everyone has questions. Yep. What burning questions does this documentary answer? I mean, obviously, I guess a big one is, was Jesus vegan or not? I guess that's the main one, correct? Well, it I would say we never we never say that, nor do we ask that question. This is a film about asking questions primarily. We don't we don't preach, we don't say a position on this film. We raise questions and we really want the audience and the viewers to decide and process. Like Juan said, you know, he he had a chance to process the material on his own. And ever since he saw it, he had a great reaction. But then our conversation after, it's just like it just goes deeper and deeper. So um, the central question of the film and and what drove me, and we can talk about how I got to this question because that's a that's a whole story in and of itself. But the central question is, is there an ethical or more so spiritual way to kill an animal? Uh, and more bluntly, if so, how would Jesus kill an animal? Mm. Mm. And that I mean, do you know? I mean, I, I would like to ask you. I mean, you, I, that's, how, that's, how do you that's a hard question. I mean, I, I'll tell you what, I'm an animal lover, right? So I, I battle that duality all the time, you know. But I, I would imagine praying over the animal, the sustenance, you know, whatever. I would imagine that's the way he would go about it, Jesus. But I, you know, when you really deliver this question to me, that puts me on the spot. I'm not gonna lie because I can't imagine Jesus killing anything. Okay. So that being said, I get I'm gonna have to jump on board with him being a vegan. I as much as I just don't want to admit it. Right, right. And that's the thing. Um, again, I'd love to talk about the backstory getting to that question and, and have some time for that. But, but then while again, we're on I'm coming from me, I'm a recovering alcoholic. Jesus drank wine. So he endorses that. Right, right. We can, we can get into all that. We can get into all that. There's there's a lot of research that's been done to compare and contrast all these different passages going straight to the Hebrew and the Greek is a big part of this whole journey and really getting to the original translation and understanding was there anything lost in that and also going back into uh, some of the le uh, less told stories from the Bible itself, as well as the historical documents that support it. Um so yeah, we'll get into all that, but no, it's a profound. Well, so here, here's something that, that that you know always burns in my mind. People always ask, well, do you know, did Jesus ever cuss or did he ever lose his temper? And I say, I always come back with, I believe he did because when he threw out the money changers, he was very angry, and I don't think he was saying, please leave, please get out of here. I think he was saying, woe unto you, which back back then I would imagine was like cussing. I'm pretty sure he was screaming at them. He was knocking over tables using a whip. So that tells me the guy could lose his temper. Second, did he drink? Well, he turned water into wine. You know, yep. so there's some things that that I battle with all the time in my mind. Now, now you're raising the question, and I'm I'm imagining you're asking the question, was he vegan? I do we have proof that he was vegan by or are we just assuming he was vegan because he was more of a pacifist i don't i mean i don't understand why we would jump on board of him being a vegan well i can cut straight to the chase on this one if we're going to go straight for that and go ahead and be the devil's advocate <laughs> so to speak and <laughs> say the first the first thing that anyone will, will say and the first thing that i said because like i told you my background i when i came into this um, and I had to face myself with this question. The first reaction is, of, of course, he ate meat. He, you know, I was taught he ate the Passover lamb. Uh, uh, and then because he was Jewish, you know, 
by descent and also that he ate fish. I mean, there's all these stories of him multiplying the fish and feeding the right, fish and correct. catching the fish. So I was like, Three. and that was, you know, growing up, that was part of the reason why I, uh, that was part of the reason why I loved fishing so much is it kind of had this connection to me, I think, um, with like that, that feeling of being a disciple or something, you know, because they were fishermen, a lot of them. And, uh, so yeah, that was my first reaction. And there's scriptures that lay out these particular incidences, but we can just start there. Let's just start there because there's a whole lot of context. Yeah, because he I fed want to masses of people with, with fish and loaves of bread, not vegetables. Right, right. So let's start with that. Now, normally having this conversation and kind of how I expected we were going to do this is I was going to break down a whole context of the history of all this all the way back into the Old Testament. Because what a lot of people, let me say this up front, what a lot of people are going to say and what I said for a really long time is, oh man, you can cherry pick the Bible to make it say whatever you want to say, right? If you got an right. agenda, if you've got something that you want to push you can cherry pick the Bible and make it say whatever. Well, that was what I said for years until the information kept coming, kept coming, kept coming to the point it was so overwhelming that the antithesis to the arguments being presented in this film or the questions being presented in this film to, to argue against them, you more so have to cherry pick verses. And even still, those verses can be put into question through X, Y, Z means. I've never seen anything like it. It's like a, it's, it's its own Da Vinci Code type of situation that I found myself in and many others. I'm not the only one. I'm just the humble person who started asking this question, but it's led me to all these people, ex Oxford theologians, biblical archaeologists, translators of the, the guy who leaked the Dead Sea Scrolls. I, I've had multiple, he's a good friend of mine. He lives down the road from me. Um, and who else? Uh, B Oxford professors of biblical hermeneutics, Hebrew hermeneutics, meaning the, the true meaning, getting into the root meanings of these words that are in the scriptures. Um, and so let's start with the fish thing, because it's a fun one. Uh, the multiplication of the fish and loaves, and it's a real popular topic right now, especially because of The Chosen. Everybody's watching The Chosen series, which is a great series, by the way. I, I, I fully support anyone getting the message of Christ because it's it, everyone would do better uh, hearing that message, right? But um, they they emphasize a lot the the fishing, the loaves and the fishes because they're you know the chosen is an independent thing like we are. You know they're trying to keep this thing free and you know get the message out to the world and they're very very independent. And we are we're we're friendly with those guys. We actually had meetings with them when we figured out that we were going to have to buy this back from Netflix. And there was a lot of conversations about in and we even submitted to their uh, their guild this film, but we decided to go a different route. Um, but ultimately. You know, uh, everyone says the multiplication of the fish and loaves. Well, let me raise this. So it says in the scripture, as we know it, that Jesus and the disciples, um, you know, came across a bunch of uh, of their hungry followers. Some one one instance is 5,000, another instance is 4,000. Some say, was it two separate events? Some say it might have been one event told differently. But regardless of that fact, this event happened. It's a miracle. And they multiply they only have five loaves and two fishes and they multiply and another instance says seven um but seven loaves but we'll, we'll stick with the five loaves and two and they multiply it out and feed everyone you know with these two and that's the miracle well in the gospel of matthew uh 16 verse 9 jesus is recounting this story to his disciples because they're doubting him they come into a moment of doubting and, and, and questioning, you know, uh, the, the position of what they're doing. And Jesus starts rattling off. Don't you remember this? Don't you remember this? And he says, don't you remember when I multiplied the loaves? Full stop. So he doesn't say fish. No, no fish. Now that's Jesus's own retelling. That's from the words of Christ himself in the scripture, the gospel of Matthew 16, 9. Okay. But in other parts of the Bible, it says loaves and fish. So Right, right. But th so, so that's from Jesus's words, though, Jesus's own words. Then, and that's in hindsight. That's him talking about it in hindsight what happened. Now go to John verse six, uh, John chapter six, verse five. Before it happens, when he realizes that there's all these people and they're all freaking out, what are we going to do? How are we going to feed these people? Jesus says, hey, go, go fetch some loaves. No mention of fish. But, but another part of the Bible mentions fish. So then so then you're, you're going to have to say, people are going to ask you, 
well, obviously, are you saying that the Bible's wrong in certain areas? And the, the fish were, right, right. you can pick and choose what you want to listen to kind of type of thing. Well, I, what I'll say to that, absolutely, yes. But what I'll say is I like to pick and choose to specifically listen to Jesus as much as possible. So these are his literal words, which then all I'm saying is that raises the question about this. Now, when I came across this particular part of this whole grand, again, we're about to talk about something in a minute that's a way bigger context than just veganism, okay? But because we're starting with this topic, we'll, we'll go ahead and dive into it. But there's a bigger contextual thing happening here that has to do with world events and everything like what Juan's saying. But to, to hone in on this, so when I got to this, uh, me as a fisherman, forget it, Jesus ate fish. But then I start looking and I start talking. I say, well, wait a minute. He does it. He's talking about it. And he's not mentioning the fish, but it, like you're saying, but it does Everybody mention fish in the accounts. Yeah, yeah. So I start getting into those accounts and I start looking through the different material that's available. Well, the the the, the scriptures themselves, when they they account for this, Matthew, Mark, uh, Luke, and John, they account for these stories. And um, let's start with the sole fact of he th they did have fish. The disciples did bring fish. Let's say that's the truth because that's what the scripture says. And I'm fine to accept that fact. If you notice in the scripture, Jesus blesses the bread, but he doesn't bless the fish. He doesn't bless it. So that raises a question. Interesting. Well, why, why would Jesus only bless the bread and, and not uh, bless the fish? Okay. Put that in my back pocket. Now let's keep looking. Um, the early church fathers, if you're familiar, I don't know. Many people may be familiar. Uh, there, there are this list of, it's kind of like this list of the, the first scholars who had the material of the Hebrew and Greek texts of the Bible in the first century after Jesus's death, um, that were forming the first kind of consensus of what this story was about and their writings. And then some of them in particular con joining up with the Roman Catholic church and everything to canonize the Bible at the council of Nicaea and other councils. Um, they utilize these church fathers kind of, you know, uh, commentary to help create what we know of as the doctrine of Christianity. Now, most of these church fathers would be considered Orthodox, you know, because we have the Eastern Orthodox Church that broke away from the, the uh, Roman Catholic Church to maintain that thread. You've got people like Jerome, uh, Hieronymus, uh, Eusebius, Irenaeus, Epiphanius. These are, th these are all these early church fathers. In multiple accounts of the early church fathers, when they're doing commentary on these stories, and they have the Hebrew text sitting right in front of them and the Greek text sitting right in front of them, they aren't recounting these fish stories. They aren't recounting that there's fish. They're saying there's bread in mm. multiple different instances, which, you know, has to raise a lot of questions. You, you feel like this is the big conspiracy. Well, the big, the big, it's a part of it. It's a part of it. And because it's not right now, like with what we're watching with the vegan movement. And, you know, I kind of feel like that's a conspiracy within itself. And I have my reasons to believe that. Right. Um, especially when they want and to we can we can talk about that yeah, yeah yeah because i mean they want to grow everything in a petri dish now and and i'm going to try to keep this youtube friendly but um you know and 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 meat you know and the meat industry basically is what i'm seeing what they're gearing up for uh what would you know this seems like it go, it's on board with with the vegan movement i don't understand what netflix would cut out i don't understand what netflix would censor i mean listen i don't watch any really documentaries on very far and few between i'll watch a documentary on on, on netflix or watch anything on netflix and i i like to watch sometimes because i like to watch the propaganda right i like to watch right. what they're feeding everybody but but well i'm having a hard time here with what would they edit out what would they take out of netflix so can you get into that because that's to me yeah, like, yeah. what would they possibly take out of this yeah, yeah. And let's table that fish story, maybe come back because there's more to okay. it. And I know your I know your listeners are going to be like, what the like there's, you know, <laughs> this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, or there, you know, that that doesn't that doesn't add up. So we can come back to it. But uh, and I'm with you all who are thinking that because again, I thought the same thing for well, years. Well, let's go ahead and finish it and then we'll go into the Netflix thing because that to me, I'm like, okay, this is an obvious vegan right pro-vegan right, right. <laughs> documentary i don't understand what what issues they'd have with it 
Right, right. Okay. So just I'll wrap it up real quick. And if we feel we need to touch on it later too, uh, we can. Um, and obviously we can always follow up conversations. If people start hitting your comments like crazy, what about this? What about this? We can always do follow-ups. We can do whatever. Um, but essentially to name some of those early church fathers that I was talking about that had the original material, we've got Augustine, Irenaeus, Cyril of Alexandria, Theodore of Heraclea. These are some of the biggest names in the early church who were uh, assessing and making commentary on this material to standardize it, right? And they're mentioning these stories and they're mentioning the bread, but they're not mentioning the fish. So it raises the question, was it just not there? Um, we don't know. I can't. We can't say yes or no, but it raises a lot of questions, right? Um, then we go into the word in the words in Greek translated as fish in our English language, because the new Testament was written in Greek. Right. Um, and it was spoken. That's something that needs to be understood is that Jesus spoke Aramaic, probably the earliest texts. We know for certain what they call the gospel of the Ebionites or the gospel of the Nazarenes or the Hebrew gospel of Matthew. There was an original gospel of Matthew that was written most likely in Hebrew or Aramaic, but it's been lost to history. But we do have fragments of it that are preserved in these early church fathers writings that were given commentary about it, but, but it's been lost in the book burning uh, in, in the, they burned a library uh, of uh, not Alexandria, but it, there was another big library that housed the last known document of this, and they say it's burned. It still might be out there, and that's some of what uh, what Juan was talking about. We want to we want to hunt down some of these texts if we can, and we have some plans to do so. But regardless, what I'm saying is, Hebrew and, and Greek are the original um, languages that these scriptures that we know and love were written in. So we got to go to that. Now, the words for fish in Greek in the New Testament, there's three words: ichthus. Prosphagion and Apsarion, three different words that are translated as fish. Ichthus straight up means fish uh, in Greek. But the interesting thing about that word, just to note, is it's heavily symbolic. The Greeks use that word as an acronym because the, the letter, you know, an acronym is every letter in the word represents another word, right? In that word, it represents in Greek, translated to English, Jesus Christ, God's son, savior. Okay. And they used it all the time as symbolism all over ichthus, ichthus. And they even created the ichthus fish. You might see it all over, you know, Texas where you're at and everywhere around the country that people who are Christian will put the fish symbol sticker on yeah. their car. And sometimes yeah. it has that yeah, word. Yep. Sometimes it has that word ichthus in it. Well, interestingly, which we, you know, get into the film, we can get into more in the gospel of John. When Jesus uh, comes across the disciples and it's another proof of his you know, existence in the resurrected body, et cetera, they're trying to catch fish. They can't catch any. And then they see him and they, you know, they cast the net and more fish come up. They finally catch fish, right? And it says in the scripture specifically that they catch 153 fish. It has the number there. This has puzzled scholars for millennia. <laughs> they're like, what is that number? Why that number? Is there something more to it? Because there's there's all of these connections with that number and it becomes very symbolic in a certain sense. Why do they? Because, you know, this is nothing new. Hebrew, every letter in Hebrew is numerological. They have gematria, as we know. Like well, everything well, is about numbers. Three, what is that, like nine? Okay. Well, yeah, there's a, when you get into the actual numerology, adding them and the gematria of it, for sure, there's there's realms we can go with that. But where we specifically go with this story in the in this film is that 500 years before Jesus uh, walked the earth, there was a guy named Pythagoras, Pythagoras. You might know him from the Pythagorean theorem, A squared plus B squared is yeah. equal C squared. We all had to learn it when we were kids. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Pythagoras was a philosopher, mathematician, uh, et cetera, et cetera. He studied in Alexandria. He was imprisoned in Alexandria where the world's greatest library was 500 years before Jesus. He was an outlaw himself in many, many ways. He was ran out of his town every single time. We don't know what happened to him because he got ran out of town. Um, but his followers, uh, they continued his, you know, kind of message and in, in, if, of, of understanding numbers of understanding ethical and philosophical debates, they heavily, you know, rolled with all the different philosophers, but there's documentation from Josephus, the Jewish historian, who is one of the primary sources for the historical record of Jesus's, Jesus's existence. So most Christians will know him if they are trying to debate, you know, Jesus's existence. Josephus is the guy you lean on because he's written about him and he's, a, he's a historian. He's not a, 
he he has no you know bone to pick in the whole thing. So Josephus, the same guy that proves Jesus's existence, also said that the Pythagoreans from 500 years before the remnants of their movement started hanging with the Essenes, which is a sect of Judaism out near Qumran by the Dead Sea. At the time of Christ, there were Pharisees who Jesus was always calling out, or or they were challenging him and he was, you know, facing up to them. The Sadducees and the Essenes. These are all mentioned in scripture. The Essenes are the ones that are responsible for the Dead Sea Scrolls, which we you know were found in 1947. Yeah. They're kind of the more monastic sect that said, hey, everything that's going on in the city, they're corrupt. They're like the truthers of their time in a way. They're like, hey, we see all this corruption. We're getting out of here. We're going off grid, you know? So that's kind of the the essence of the Essenes. Well, the Pythagoreans came and found camps with the Essenes, Josephus says, and they intermingled and shared their doctrines, and they came to share their knowledge with each other, all right? Well, why this is all important is because that number 153 is an extremely sacred number to Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans. Why? Because, ironically, it's one half of the ratio dimensions of the Vesica Pisces, which is another word, a Latin word for the ichthus, the fish. Mm, right. It's, it's a symbol made from two conjoining circles. You know a Venn diagram? When yes. you've got two circles yeah. and you got the yes. space in the middle? Right. That that design, that design is a Vesica Pisces. And if you can imagine, no matter what size it is, from point to point, draw a line. And then from the, the widest point of the bulge on the curves, draw a line. You've got a dimension there. What is that height to that width, right? Well, that width, it's 265 to 153. Right. Interesting. Okay. That's the dimension. Now, the number 153 on a multiplication table makes a perfect kind of pyramid design in it, and it, and it, the numbers go out in a certain way that's also sacred. And Pythagoras was all obsessed with geometry and everything as well. So now. So there's a lot that, of geometria in the Bible. Oh, big time, big time. But what's interesting here, and it's some of it's Hellenistic, we don't know. We don't know, was that the original tension? of the people who wrote the scripture, or, you know, a lot of these scriptures were written, we know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, some up to 100 years, uh, 100 AD. Um, so way after Jesus' death, when they're getting all intermingled with all the Hellenistic stuff, you know? So why I raise this is because Pythagoras himself has a famous story told about him. And again, 500 years before Jesus, that he was walking along the shore, and he saw some fishermen, right? And he sees the fishermen. Now, here's the point, important note about Pythagoras. is Pythagoras believed that in an ethical concern for all of God's creatures. Um, and he believed that the way we, he, almost like a karma kind of thing, but he didn't call it karma, um, that you inflict something on these beings, it's coming back around to you. And so I'm he, he, <laughs> he, he encouraged... <laughs> He encouraged all of his uh, pupils that study his mathematics and everything that the only way they could study with him is they had to drop all that. They had to drop products and, you know, be, he, he used to say he could hear, you know, uh, it, it was like he could hear the voices of his long lost friends and dogs and all of these things. So he had this I kind of philosophy. Right, right. right. So, so well, what I was going to say is that this particular story about Pythagoras, he's walking along the shore, right? And he sees this, these fishermen who have caught all these fish, and he strikes up a deal with them. He says, hey, if I can just with my eyes guess how many fish are in your net, and I get it right to the exact number, you have to throw them back. And so they're like, ah, oh, you know, fishermen, oh, we love a good bet or whatever, right? And he, he wages it, and he guesses the number, and they have to throw them back. Now, it doesn't state the number in the text, Maybe at one point it used to. I'll just say that. But it doesn't now in the records that we have state the number. But what do we know? The fish and Pythagoras' sacred number is 153, right? Now, you've got a very similar story in the story of Christ coming across his fishermen disciples. They catch all these fish. 
Now, it doesn't say anything about him striking up a deal or anything, but it does say he performed a miracle. And in its own way, Pythagoras' mathematical genius or whatever to be able to guess that number is its own kind of miracle, not to the level of what Christ and actually bending reality, right? But it's it's right. its own, you know, perceived to them, some simple fishermen, it would have been like a miracle to them that he guessed that, right? But regardless, we've got these kind of overtones that are similar. And guess what else we have in Jesus' in, in Jesus' story? He tells the disciples to drop their nets. Well, he doesn't tell them that, but they drop their nets and they follow him. They leave their fishing industry behind. You know, it's, it says it says that in the scripture. So you've got these parallels tied by that number and tied by the fact that the Pythagoreans were hanging out with the Essenes. And how are the Essenes important to Christ? John the Baptist mingled and got his whole, his whole ministry started from the Essene Qumran uh, division of the Red Sea and the Jordan where he was baptizing everyone. And who baptized I mean, Jesus? I, why wouldn't it say in the Bible, you know, why wouldn't he just stress in the Bible? Why do we have to look through, for clues and go this way and that way through this maze? Why wouldn't it just say in the Bible, you shall not eat meat from Jesus? Like, he, why wouldn't he just say it? You know what I mean? Just make it yeah, simple yeah. for us so we don't have to go through this this crazy hunt to figure it out. You know, I, am I wrong? I mean, I'm just saying, why wouldn't he just state the obvious and say, don't eat meat? But brother, that's the question that haunts me all the time. And that's the question. Why, <laughs> that's the reason why I'm, that's why I'm still on the trail. But I'll say this. There's a lot that Christ didn't say that's implied. Um, you know, people always, but, but think, I mean, if it was so important, it seems you know, to me that he would just say it, but maybe it's something that he's like, look, if you want to eat fish, eat fish. I don't, maybe he doesn't, but, yeah, yeah. but maybe well, it's well, not such a mortal, but it's not such a big sin. If you do, you know, that, well, I don't think I want to, yeah, and I want to clear that up. We're not talking about it being a sin here. And I want everyone who's a believer, you know, I follow Christ myself. You know, I aim every day to be Christ-like. I wear WWJD bracelets to remind myself what would Jesus do. That's kind of how I got into this. What would Jesus do? Um, but what I will say is that uh, though it doesn't explicitly say it, like I said, there's there's this whole idea that Christ is the king of the Jews, you know, that that's part of the political reason why he may have been crucified, right? There's the concept of him as the Messiah, this and that. But when what we got to realize, and everybody knows this, and any theologian will tell you this, in the scripture, that's always what people are saying about him. And then he says, well, what do you say I am? You know, he says he always flips it and a lot of times doesn't implicitly say certain things. Now, on the regard of sin, I want to clear that up. That this isn't an issue of sin or salvation or redemption or anything like that. I don't want anybody to think that. This is an issue of justice and an issue of understanding where our world is at right now and some of the current events, like uh, Juan said, and why this is important to that. So I don't want to get lost too much in the the moral framework of you know the dogma of 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 Christianity and what's a sin and what what's not a sin. It's more about this justice issue, the food system, where we're at, what's actually happening that people aren't aware of that we can talk about but just to wrap up you know that that piece on on you know why wouldn't he just say it well we know and there's again we could talk about this for hours but we know that saint paul in all of the letters to you know galatians colossians if he you know the the the, the letters to the different towns where their uh the the gospel is spreading um uh, multiple times this aspect of well wait a minute you know um People should, you know, people are questioning, should we eat meat? But the, you know, Paul says the weak man eats only vegetables, you know, concerned for eating meat. He says, eat any meat in the marketplace, you eat any flesh. It's actually the word flesh in, in Greek. Eat any flesh in the marketplace without raising conscience. Like Paul's trying to clear this up, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what Paul's actually doing, um, Paul's a very complex character and a lot of people demonize him who don't fully understand him. That's I not relate something. a lot to him. Yeah, yeah, it's not so. But I think we all do because we all have, we're all complex, you know. We we're all trying to figure out life and do our best. And Paul, you know, he, these early Jewish Christians for for a long time before he converted to to them. And in fact, as you'll see in the film, and as we can discuss further, he was on a manhunt and had big disagreements with James the Just, the leader of the Nazarenes, who was actually Jesus's half brother. Uh, James, Protestant. Right? James, James, Jesus' half-brother. Well, what's interesting about James? Every historical document that we have of James states within the first paragraph that he never ate flesh. And 
that uh, that he was and, and he's deeply connected to historical record shows that he's deeply connected to the early movement of the Ebionites again, which is the Ebionite gospel, the, the Hebrew gospel of Matthew that is preserved by these early church fathers. That's his people. He was the leader of the Ebionites. Now, what is the Ebionites? Why have we never heard that word? Well, ask yourself, why have you never heard that word? It's been definitely, definitely a suppressed word and people group for a really long time. We can get into all that too. But the e the word ebion in Hebrew is the poor, the poor ones. Blessed are the poor, right? Blessed are the poor, the meek. So this was a word given to the Nazarenes and the people that were following James the Just, the leader of the movement after Christ was crucified. Um, and they were saying, oh, th those that's just the poor people. That's the poor people over there, you know? And so yeah. they took that on. People would slander it, but they just took it on. Okay, we're the poor ones. We're the Ebionites, right? Well, Paul was tracking these people down. He there, there's record historical record in the uh, oh, Paul writings. was trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Paul I was mean, Paul. You really want to look at it that way? Yeah, he was Herodian. He was of Herodian descent. You know, King Herod was the um, was the the uh, Roman official over Judea at that time. He built the temple that Jesus went in and turned the tables over. And I really want to transition to that soon because that's the big cover up is what really happened at the temple. Well, but I, I do want to leave something for the documentary. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we're no, talking about sure. a lot of stuff here. I want to talk about the main issues here, which let's, let's go back to, because there's a lot in this documentary. I want to play the, I want to play the, uh, the, the preview of it. I want to play the, I mean the trailer and I want to, I really want to get back to this Netflix thing because we okay. said we were going to struggle back to it. Let's get back to that Netflix scene because that kind of blows my mind because this to me, you're saying the biggest conspiracy here is Jesus is a vegan, right? What, what would they cut out? I don't understand. What, what, what did they censor? Why did, why are you trying to get to, why are you trying to buy it back from Netflix? Yeah. Really quick. Let me clear it. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to divert on this. I just want to clear it up. The term vegan is a 20th century concoction. That's a new term. Nobody used that term. Uh, the Before that, it was vegetarian for a long time. And for a long time, vegetarian meant kind of what vegan means now. Before that, ironically, it was Pythagorean, who I talked about Pythagoras because of the way they live. They just literally, anyone who kind of abstained from an animal product, they would kind of call them way, 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 way back uh, Pythagoreans. They just assumed that's who they were. Um, so that... I would like to get a little more refined in that statement. You know, this is a cover up about Jesus being vegan. More so, this is a this is a cover up about an ethical position that not only Jesus held, but the Nazarenes, the movement that he was a part of, which is another big cover up in the film, and who the Nazarenes were, and why don't why we don't really know who they were, and why we think the term Nazarene just means someone from Nazareth, which it doesn't. Um who they really were and how this ethical position was more so call it what label you want to call it. They just held thou shall not kill mm. the first commandment. Cause you mentioned why it's, why isn't this ever stated in the Bible? Well, yeah. I mean, I was just going to bring that up. Why isn't it in the commandments, but thou not thou shall not kill is pretty much can apply to everything. Right. Right. It can apply to everything. Thou shall not kill. And people, you know, that are listening to this can be like, Oh, he doesn't realize it's thou in Hebrew. I do realize more accurately, which everyone thinks is a term for taking the life of a human unnecessarily, you know, not in a self-defense situation or whatever, but premeditated taking the taking the life of a human. But that's not what it necessarily meant in the old days. And we can get into that too, because it's a big mistranslation of what really happened in the temple that day. But there is a there is a longstanding movement called the Nazarenes that we can talk about. And there's an ethical position that's in protest to what's happening in the temple. King Herod's temple, the Roman built, Roman manufactured, Roman financed temple in Judea. And he and this movement had a major protest on what was going on in there that has been completely diverted, mistranslation, misunderstood by myself and many, many others for millennia. And the revelation of it that this film is revealing is going to change the way we think about a lot of things besides just what we eat. That's that's it's it's also current events, like Juan, Juan said. So just wanted to clear that up uh, with the V word, because <laughs> I know it can be triggering for people. So um, now to the Netflix piece. Yeah. So essentially to give you to round off that that backstory I was giving you, you know, the previous films were licensed to Netflix, Cowspiracy and What the Health uh, by my co-director. And then the most recent film, Seaspiracy, was a Netflix original. 
uh, piece of content. Um, now I wasn't involved with Cowspiracy. Um, I also, uh, you know, when I met Kit, my co-director, it was at a Cowspiracy screening after he had already produced What the Health, and uh, it was about to come out. But I went to a screening and a Q and A, and that is actually in the film, which you'll see in this in this teaser if you want to show it here in a minute. Yeah, let me let um, me show it really fast. Let, let people, yeah, yeah. Let's get people to watch this for just for a second. Sounds good. Is there a spiritual way to kill an animal? Um, I'll, I'll put it this way. How would Jesus kill an animal? Everyone in the Western world's entire life is affected by the church. We're talking about some of the most powerful, profitable industries on the planet. It's a conspiracy of silence. Nobody talks about it. Nobody shows it. It's a mafia. Is there any danger of making a film like this? You just wait and see. They will stop at nothing to keep this truth from getting out. Yeah. So, so that was, the, that was the scene there. Uh, a representative of, of, of this moment, Kip and I, we met at this screening and I raised, you know, the, this question became the central focus of our conversation. Is there a spiritual way to kill an animal or how would Jesus kill an animal? And the reason why we had that conversation is because Kip is a filmmaker that has a longstanding history of talking about this specific topic. I have a history of being a gospel musician barbecue uh, barbecue loving fishing hunting gospel musician that um again we can talk my backstory later but i came up into this question because of a series of events in my own personal life that led me to this and when i had this burning question and tried to talk about it with my peers um in the church it was uncomfortable People, people, there was some kind of divertive thing where people didn't yeah, want to I talk can't about answer. it. There, is there a they, spiritual they, way to kill an animal? I can't answer that. Yeah, they couldn't. You know, people say, oh, it's the kosher way or oh, it's this or it's that. But when you say, okay, well, literally, so then Jesus slit the animal of a, of a lamb, you you can see Jesus doing that. And like, then what? And, you know, so it's like, it's a regular, that question of itself. But then even just discussing the topic, the angles of it, I found myself in a situation where trying to get to the bottom of this. Um, led me to have some uncomfortable conversations to the point where I kind of had to back away from my career for a little while, not my faith, my faith or anything, but I had to back away from the forward facing entity that is mega churches and all these other kind of things that I was involved with and really dive into this. And at that time is when I met Kip. And again, it wasn't on by on purpose. I I was at a I was working an event in a Los Angeles. Uh, because I was having to get odd jobs at the time because I wasn't playing music and making money. So I was working for these different companies that were selling, you know, healthy chocolates and this and that doing demos and everything. Yeah. So I'm at this event supporting my friend who has a chocolate company and, uh, and they just so happened to be doing a screening of Cowspiracy. And I was like, Oh, that's that guy that does films on the ethical or the, the environmental animal stuff. And, he you know, maybe he'll, be able to have this conversation so i went and ha tried to have the conversation with it boom he was open to it the further we talked uh we ran up to his time where he was going to miss his flight out of la and i said i'll wow. take you to, i'll take you to the airport in the airport on the or on the way to the airport he's like dude we need to make a movie on this like this is this is big stuff what we're talking about here uh, because a lot of what's in the film and a lot of the research i had done up that point like i said i was going to write a book if i could that was going to be my first format but then he's like, no, we need this needs to be a movie. And I'm like, I agree. So we kind of hit it off that day. It took a whole year before we started filming uh, because he was wrapping up so much of what he was doing. But I just want to clear that up because I know straight up, you'll see it in your comments. People are going to say, oh, this is, you know, Cal Spiracy, what the hell is Spiracy? This is Netflix propaganda. Netflix paid them. This is a Klaus Schwab thing. You know, whatever it is they're going to yeah, say. Right. I can tell you. I, I can tell you from personal experience. First of all, like I said, I'm a gospel musician. When I moved out of uh, uh, of that setup to go deep into this, I had to move into my van, and I lived out of my van oh, for there. seven years. By a river, by a river. <laughs> actually, by the Pacific, <laughs> by the Pacific Were you Ocean. Fishing in the river? <laughs> no fishing. I got into I got into I got into surfing, catching catching waves instead of fish. Same same feeling. Um, but no, I moved into my van. And uh, that was the only way I could afford to make this. So no zero Klaus Schwab money. I can guarantee you that probably would have been nice at the time. Uh, and then Kip, let me tell you, he does not have a fund. Like the we were struggling the entire time. That's why it took seven years to get to this point from when we met. We met in 2016. It took you seven years to make this. 
We met in 2016, oh. Kip and I, and now here we are now trying to get it out. It took a long time, took a lot of research, but also the fun side of things. Like I said, um, Netflix, of we can talk now, about now, all let kinds me, of Let me ask you this. While you were making this, how long have you been, a, a, obviously, how long have you been a vegan during this whole, did you stop, did you stop eating meat? Prior to making this documentary, during, or, I mean, were you vegan the whole time? I mean, making this documentary? Yeah, so you'll see in the film, it'll tell my backstory, but it's very condensed because it's a 90-minute film. So we move through it. This film is fast. It moves. It's rapid. It's high-paced. It's action-packed. We have a car chase scene in it, all these things. So just let you know, it's it, it, even if you don't agree with it, it's entertaining. I can tell you that. Um, but but, who's chasing you in the car chase? Well, we can talk about that. meat eaters. <laughs> no, uh, we're 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 chasing we're chasing the uh, Muslim mafia in India. Uh, wow, yeah. sword sword wielding, weapon wielding uh, Muslim mafia. So, um, yeah, this would be a good moment to talk about my backstory because it does tie into this moment of of Kip also clearing up the this is propaganda and it's paid by this or whatever. So you can get a little more understanding of my backstory and 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 that what you just asked. So essentially, what happened in my life is that, like I said, I was the meat biggest meat eater, full on Christian gospel musician, and then uh, about a decade ago. Um, it's been around for a long time, but it got really, really popular. There was a trend called the Daniel fast made popular through a book by Rick Warren, purpose driven life. Um, he's a pastor in San Diego, mega church pastor. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, he wrote purpose driven life, but he, he had a program called the Daniel plan, which is a scripture based health program. Cause he was real overweight and he realized a lot of his church congregation was real overweight and was like, Hey, you know, we can't let ourselves slip. We're all focused on the body and salvation, or the the soul and salvation. We're letting our bodies slip. We can't do God's work if we're all like if we can't move and stuff. So he built this biblical based uh, kind of health and wellness program called the Daniel Plan, which uh, I started to implement in my own life at that time uh, at about seventeen years old. Uh, my family started doing it as well. Um, there's a big spiritual component about drawing closer to God, and there's also a diet-based component. Now, so to give you the backstory, when on that one, in the scripture, in the book of Daniel, in the first chapter, uh, or the first book, yeah, Daniel is a slave in Babylon. He's a Hebrew, but he's a slave in Babylon, um, captured. And the way that they used to deal with that uh, is when people were real, real smart, the Hebrews that were really smart, they would put them in a special area and they would get them to study more and they would teach them all their Babylonian ways and they would try to get them smart and they would feed them real well and they would treat them real well because that just helps the kingdom, right? It's a smart method, honestly, but they right. were still slaves, you know, just the smart ones. So in, in, his, uh, in his time there, he and his brothers, um, when they were feeding them all this food, the choice foods of the king, uh, and it says in the King James Version, the, the flesh, you know, and the, and the wine, uh, which again, we'll talk about the wine and alcohol part later because I know you brought that up. But they refused that part. They said, "Hey, we don't want to eat this. We only want pulses." Is the word in the scripture, uh, which means a seed bearing plant. He says, "Just give us pulses and water. That's all we want." And then the uh, the guy in the king's court that's overseeing him and his brothers is like, "Oh my goodness, we can't have you do that." And essentially, he's saying no because I mean, he by the king if these guys are unhealthy or unfit or this, you know. So he's like, I can't have you do that. You, you got to do this. And then he says, well, do this. Just give us 10 days. Give us 10 days. And at the 10th day, test us against everyone in the kingdom on every aptitude test you want to give us and see how we fare. And if we fare better, let us let us st stick with this. So after 10 days, they test healthier, stronger, and wiser, wow. the scripture says, than all the other men in the kingdom. And not only that, Daniel goes on to interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dreams that the jesters and the, you know, back then they used to rule their kingdom by their dreams and stuff. And they would have right. interpreters and all these magi that would do that. So Dan, some these magi couldn't interpret this one particular dream. And Daniel steps in and says, Oh, you know, the God I serve says it's this, this is what it means. And the King's blown away Nebuchadnezzar and he puts him as like his right hand man. Right. Is that the so, dream of the gold, the iron, the steel or the silver? Right. And okay. Yep. Yep. And, and I have a whole the nations is falling or something like the nations, that. Okay. the nations, which is very relevant today as well. Correct. Uh, there's a whole story. We can talk about that, but anyhow, 
Daniel, then, you know, he's in the good, the, the good side of the king for a while. And as we all know, at a, at a certain point, he falls on the bad side because he's worshiping God and he's not supposed to do that. And then they throw him to the lions. Then the lions don't eat him. They put him in the fiery furnace. The furnace doesn't burn him up. So when I was a kid, you know, well, the lions didn't eat him because he was a vegan. <laughs> that kid, hey, <laughs> the hey. lions were getting ready to go vegan too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, in the in in the book of Isaiah, in the prophetic kingdom of heaven that's coming, what it says is the wolf will lay with the lamb, the child will lay with the serpent, and you know harm each other. Um. So, but before you know digressing into all of that, um, Daniel was my superhero growing up. All the kids got Marvel these days and all that, but for me, you know, I my family raised me in the scriptures. And Daniel was one of my superheroes. Oh, oh my God, this guy stood up to lions and freaking fire. Like <laughs> what? So, yeah. uh, and the way I learned about him is at the time, there was a program called Veggie Tales. You might've heard of it. A lot of Christians will know about it that are watching. And it was a uh, CGI uh, computer graphics animated series on Bible stories. And the characters of the Bible stories were vegetables. They were portrayed as vegetables. So like it was a, a tomato and a cucumber and they're the different characters that, you know, one of them's Daniel and one of them's Shadrach and Meshach and the whole thing. So that was how I learned about the Dor Daniel story. Well, funny enough, when I come around as a 17 year old and I start doing this Daniel plan because I'm kind of into it, I'm in the magic mega church thing and I'm trying to take God more seriously in my life. Um, I'm like, well, wait a minute. I'm supposed to only eat vegetable. And like I said, I was kind of pissed. I was like, yeah, like, how am I going to do this? You know? And, uh, and I'm like, is this really, do I really have to do this part of it? You know? And so I start looking into it and sure enough, it says it right in there in the scripture that he only ate vegetables. And I'm like, well, how did I miss that part? I go out and I find my veggie tails tape and I put it on zero mention on the veggie tails tape of the, the diet part zero. And the iron and the irony it's called veggie tales. It's a yeah. story of biblical characters of vegetables right, it's and, right there. And they leave out the part where you only eat vegetables. So, that was kind of interesting. So I'm like, huh, well, is there anything else in the Bible? Like I wanted to find the proof, like, does anywhere else in the Bible say anything about this kind of thing? Cause I, I'm not convinced, you know? And then sure enough, the first thing I find, boom, Genesis 1 in the garden of Eden, the prescribed diet is vegetables. It's, you know, anything bearing seed. So Adam and Eve are prescribed, you know, all so those from the get go, that's a commandment basically. Yeah, yeah, it says everything that it, all the herb wielding seed, uh, all the herbs and fruits wielding seed, will be yours for food. Um, it, it says, never said so, anything about animals. Not in Genesis one twenty nine. Not in the Garden of Eden. No. Now wow. it comes in later, and we can talk about that. We'll talk about that. But I'm just saying that's the ideal. Um, and then the same thing is like I always knew, and I was always drawn to since a kid. The whole prophetic vision of Isaiah and the end times. Everybody's you know concerned. I'm sure there's a lot of your viewers about end times prophecy and all this. Well, the 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 main guy for that, you know, we got Ezekiel, we've got Daniel, we've got all these people that talk about so, that. But I, Isaiah says the wolf will lay with the land. It's this peaceable vision that's very similar to the Garden of Eden, but more developed with human intervention alongside God. And it's the same type of situation where there's this plant based diet. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like what? What? So why was, you know, if you look in the Old Testament and, and mainly really it's big in the Old Testament, it's the sacrifice or the ritual of of sacrificing animals to you know that's like the big thing in the old testament so how did jesus fare with that i mean i know he was against the pharisees i know he spoke out against these things and even today with certain groups and elites i'm sure it's still a big thing so yeah let's talk about that for a second yeah well really quick before i do that because i know you wanted to hit the netflix thing and what you just brought up right there is a deep rabbit hole. <laughs> That's the one oh, yeah. that that Juan's going to be most interested in and maybe want to chime in on. But um, do we want to table that right there and come back to it and do the Netflix first? Or do you want to do, do the Netflix? Do let's, let's, okay. I've been trying to get that out of you. Yeah, let's do yeah. the Netflix. So, so to get to that point, let me just say, I was doing the Daniel fast. That's what raised the questions. What's the deal with this? What does the scripture have to say about this? Which then led me into this whole spiritual and ethical conundrum. That led to, well, what did Jesus have to say about this? There we have it. Is there a spiritual way? What would Jesus do when it comes to killing an animal? If he's going to eat an animal, an animal has to be killed. You know, what did he have to say about it, right? And then that's what opened the rabbit hole for me. Now, by the time I get to Kip Anderson, the co-director of Calspiracy and What the Health, as you saw in the in the the preview there, but like I told you, I was working this event. I stand, you know, I have this conversation with him. We kick off and we say, we're going to make a film about this. 
we then started filming in 2017 in Israel. Um, we traveled the world. Uh, Rome went to the Vatican, interviewed at the Vatican. Um, we went to Nepal, uh, India, to other sacred si sites where animal sacrifice is still happening today in mass scale. Um, we went to uh, Paraguay for particular reasons down there with what's going on in the Chaco Forest with the indigenous, which relates to this whole story. We don't have to go in that rabbit hole, but just all over the world, we've been studying this, right? Um, and then we put together this this cut of the film, this thesis of the film, right? And we bring it back to Netflix. Now, mind you, like I said, when Netflix signed Seaspiracy as a Netflix original, they also signed this film, which was originally entitled something else. It was originally entitled uh, another film that was, you know, again, this follow up film to Cowspiracy, What the Health, Seaspiracy, and then this film tackling particularly the ethical side of how we treat animals, but with this religious, spiritual lens, because whether you're Christian or not, whether you're Jewish or not, or any religion or not, all of our moral and ethical frameworks are gleaned from the society that we live in, which ultimately has an underpinning of the dominant religious ideology of that culture, you know? So you can't get around it. Even someone who's listening that might be an atheist, like you right. have ethical frameworks that were influenced, if you're in the West, that were influenced by the Judeo-Christian values, right? So that's what this film was intended to look at, right? But what we found... <laughs> is through my, you know, kind of bent on the Christian, Judeo-Christian side and the research and where it led us, this story went a whole other direction and went real deep and real crazy. And so we started putting that into the film. Some of this oh, material- Oh, started putting the ritual stuff into the film and that's where Netflix was like, ah, ah, ah. That we started putting some of that into the film and uh, the material, as Juan mentioned, that's really interesting, particularly around the Nazarenes and this movement- mm -hmm these kind of things. And we, we got some communication back from them that was like, Hey guys, uh, this isn't what we really signed up for. Um, wow. they, 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 yeah, they even, uh, they even took our footage. Well, when I say took, I want to be very clear legally. <laughs> we were required to, and asked to grant them our footage to, um, do their own edit. They were going to do their own edit. And they played it back for us, and um, we just weren't pleased. We weren't we weren't excited about the direction of where it was going. It was way softer, way you know, in our opinion, it was just a softer wow. direction. wasn't getting to the gritty of some of the key points, the history making points. We feel that uh, needed to be in the film, and so we just had this hard conversation where we're like, "Hey, so we, it's on, it's on the shelf right now at Netflix." So it was on the shelf for a couple years. <laughs> And we had to figure out what to do. And uh, I mean, I'll tell you straight up as a grown man, I, I had my own cry about it. You know, like it was it was a tough, tough part of my life. I was living out of a van. I was like, because was you my wanted on Netflix. You obviously wanted to be seen by a huge yeah, audience. Yeah, yeah. I wanted you didn't I want wanted to be butchered. Yeah, I didn't want to be butchered. And, you know, coming out of I just so everyone knows, I, you know, spent six, seven years as a career gospel musician and. I didn't come straight into that with any particular straight out of the gate success. Like it took me a long time, six years, seven years to build my career as a gospel musician to the point of right when I got signed by Sony records with the band that I was in uh, and started actually making it a, a career that made like any money at all. Um, that was when I had to pull back yeah. and start doing this. So I gave up that to pursue wow. this. But then it was like, I kind of thought it was this grace of God thing that boom, right when I start pursuing this, I meet keep boom, uh, Kip, boom, we get this Netflix contract. Oh, thank goodness. I can at least eat, you know, like, or I can at yeah. least make sure that this film is going to be seen by everyone. And then we had to rip that bandaid off because it was like, I can't do it. I, you know, can I ask what, you, what the deal was or, or is that too personal or what, what, what do you mean in particular? Like the deal, what kind of deal did you sign with Netflix? How did that work? Well, it was an exclusive deal as a Netflix original, meaning that the only place the film was going to be accessible would be on Netflix as a Netflix original. And gotcha. they gave us, a, you know, I can't get into the specifics, yeah, but they, right, gave us okay. a, they gave us a particular amount of production funding to go out and help. It wasn't a lot, um, but, you know, it was, it, was, it was what we needed. And then they were going to give us the rest on the back end, you know, and then that was it. That's all they give. Netflix doesn't give royalties um, at all or anything like that, which, they again, don't? 
No. So that's the thing. That's what people need to get real with this when they say, oh, Klaus Schwab, and this is the WF funding all this, and they want to propagandize you. I'm a, I'm in agreement with 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 these big institutions and what they're feeding us, you know, and how they're manipulating. Yeah. But what I'll say about these particular films in this instance, just to clear it up on behalf of Kip, too, because I know him now and I see how he lives his life. Uh, Cowspiracy, what the hell? These were licensed after they, they were made. They were not funded by Netflix. These films were not funded by Netflix. They were funded. Cowspiracy, I, again, I won't give you the exact budget, but it was like people, when they hear the budget of that film, they drop the, their jaws drop. Kip saved up a bunch of money from working years and years and years to fund that himself. And then he made that. And that's why you go watch the film. The production quality is not, you know, it's, you can tell. <laughs> and, but it's an amazing film, the story and what, it, and it moved me. Well, that's that just like the avenue to let the films be seen. You're big, you're right. doing all the work and funding it yourself. Exactly. And so people need to understand that those first two films, those first two films were licensed. And again, you know, it's just enough to survive. And then you don't have enough to fund future films. So then you have to go beg and ask people like, right. hey, do you believe in this idea, please? And then, uh, and then we came up on Seaspiracy, which Netflix did supply funding for that film and did supply funding for, for this film as well when it was entitled The Other Name before we had the disagreement. Again, it was, it was just enough to get by, and then we didn't get the second half of that because we never we, we, we backed out of the deal and said we got to keep this film true. So I want people to understand that, you know, and, and any documentary filmmaker will tell you this that's had a film on a platform like this. They don't pay royalties. They give you a one-time fee. And they're the juggernaut. They get to pull the shots. They they get to tell you how much it's worth, you know. And it's not yeah. it's not much. It's not a good business. And so that's a whole other piece of this. We're going to try to really make it easier. And you see Angel Studios doing that. You know, that's why Angel Studios is doing what they're doing. It's not fair what well, they're they doing. The whole, they do they did the whole pay it forward thing with Sound of Freedom, exactly, which, which was genius. Let exactly. me ask you this. So, so now, so now this movie is going to be in theaters how many inter how many theaters did you guys lock down how many theaters is it going to be in yeah so basically once we got our rights back uh we like juan said we did a whole crowdfunding on kickstarter we were trying to figure out for years how we were going to do this but we were able to do a crowdfunding for kickstarter and a bunch of people came together to make that happen and then uh and then we we got our rights to be able to release the film handle all the legal that we needed to handle on that time so we could just go a different route of distribution our original plan um our original plan was just to go straight to digital and stream it everywhere our goal is for everyone to see this film uh to have the film free as many places as possible same thing as angel studios what they're doing with um ch the chosen so this, this is kickstarter that i'm on right here yep yep this is the kickstarter right, so they can donate here well, well, that's the Indiegogo. No, no, that's all closed. We, we closed that out. That's okay. the Indiegogo and then the Kickstarter. Um, but yeah, you see there, 3,000, almost 4,000 people uh, came together to support us. Um, wow. Wow. But uh, essentially, we we got our rights. And then through the stir of all this, uh, we were able to start a conversation with uh, this theatrical distribution company called Trafalgar Releasing. Now, if you're familiar, again, just to reference them, because I think what they're doing is crushing it. They're, it. There's a whole new wave of of how we can make these independent documentaries that tell the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth as much as possible. Uh, not only sustainable, but reach the most amount of people. And The Chosen and Angel Studios, they're doing that profoundly by um, you know, uh, releasing these films in theaters through what's called event cinema. Event Cinema is where basically a company, the the the, the one that uh, I believe the Chosen and Angel Studios and Sound of Freedom used, is uh here here in the states. Um, oh, what's it called? I forget the name of it, but there's a there's a company that basically they put the film out in cinemas just for one night only, or maybe two nights only. That's it, and they see how it does, and if it does really well, then it can extend into a full run. Right. But there's all these stipulations you have to have. You have to prove that you have the audience to be able to support it and all of these things. But you can put it in theaters. And uh, and if it does really well, then you're able to keep it in theaters. And so there was a particular company that does it here in the States. And then there's a particular company that does it internationally called Trafalgar Releasing. And that's who we got in contact with. And they recently uh, they, they do a lot of concert um, one night event only like live concerts with like U2 and this and that you know so 
uh, th but they have films that they do and they, they said, Hey, we'll help you with this. Uh, you know, we, we, we think there is something here, but you got to prove yourself sort of thing. Right. So we're, um, we're putting the film in theaters through this method, uh, one night only worldwide, March 20th. We're in every English speaking nation. So, uh, U S UK, uh, Ireland, um, New Zealand, Australia, um, I think there's a, even one playing here in El Paso. Yeah, yeah, it's in El Paso. Um, oh, 650 plus theaters. It's all over the U.S. That's where our and predominant market is. And if it does well, is. then it goes to more theaters, correct? That's how it works. Right, right. And here in the U.S. too, it's 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 March 20th. But in the U.S., out the other territories, U.K. and all that, it's just that date. But in the U.S., we have an encore on March 24th, which is Palm Sunday, which is the big day of the temple cleanse of, of Christ that we talk about this cover up in the film and what actually happened that day. So it's very, very significant. And I know Juan and many of the listeners are all about dates and times and the cycles of, you know, the seasons and what's happening. Yeah. And this was not, again, this was not planned by us. This is just how the cards fell. When we got this distribution, we weren't ready. What you're going to see in the film is a raw version of this film because we lost all that funding and we just had to figure out what to do. And so we, they said, hey, we can help you put this film out, but there was a gap. Again, it's like the parting of the Red Sea with Moses. Because of the SAG after strike, you know, that whole thing happened with all the actors and everyone that said that, you know, they were refusing the whole AI thing and they they put themselves on strike. That happened mm. last fall. That caused all of these movies in the last uh, number of months to get delayed. And there's a golden wimp window of opportunity that's happened until now just the Oscars that went off. And now movies are going to start coming out again. But there's a window of opportunity right now where the cinemas are pretty dead. So they were right. like, hey, we got to get this film out now while there's a window. March yeah, the only movie that I even know is in, in the theater and I was doing. And I, I mean right. – and, and that's and that's the first of a wave of them. And so basically, this company that we're working with, this distributor, they said, "Hey, we got to get this out now. March twentieth is our date. Like we can't go any later than that, um, because of this whole scenario of all, this flood of all these films that got delayed that are to come out." And guess what? It just again, it's these divine alignment timing things. It just so happens to be March twentieth and twenty fourth, Palm Sunday, this significant day that we go into in the film so oh. it's all over the u.s it's our biggest market there's every city no matter what city you're in if you go on christspiracy.com uh uh and and click get tickets there's a a, a f search field where you can put your city in and it'll show you all the theaters near you that are playing this I'll, and it's really i'll put yeah. that down in the link below so it's christspiracy.com buy a ticket there whatever theaters closest to them and anyone, I mean, this, and then it's, and hopefully this takes off and you'll get more and more and more theaters, correct? Exactly. More and more theaters, more and more showtimes, more and more ability for people to hear the truth. We don't want this thing to just come and go before we get to digital. You know, we want to make the biggest splash we can. And we are going to go to digital eventually, but it's going to be a whole different experience digital. When you're in that room with everybody and we got it in full 5.1 surround sound, and it's like, Again, the communal experience of being with people, having an experience of something like this being revealed, it's a whole different thing than just sitting in your home. Is there, is there a goal okay, in mind? And Nino, Nino, let me dump it, jump in here for a second. This is a movie that I think you want to see on the big screen. When you see it at home in the computer and stuff like that, I, yeah, okay. I enjoyed the fact that I got to see it on a large screen. And uh, with people that understood some of the, the material, um, I, I think there is, you said a communal experience or something. There's a, a neighborhood you're in. And I also, uh, I think the audience reaction to watch how people see this and then the processing in their minds and what they're seeing, um, there's a certain enjoyment level, uh, even a beauty to that. Uh, cause you can see uh, other people having the aha moment, the same as you you're having, and there's an agreement somehow that happens there. Um, I don't think that, uh, anybody that goes to the movie, um, you know, I have to be careful what I'd say, but I'd almost say, look, I'll pay it, pay the ticket if you didn't like it, but I, I won't. But the, the reality is I don't yeah, think I there's going to be very many people that go see this movie that won't feel that they were done a service by Cameron and the people who went to this incredible effort. You got to remember, you know, living in in the the van 
might sound great right up until about the third or fourth year, right? <laughs> and and he, this is a labor of love. In fact, when you look at those 4,000 people that helped Cameron buy back the rights from Netflix, that was people who feel very strongly about this issue, who wanted it to be heard in a specific way. And I had several friends that went in. Uh, we all went in, took care of this. I'm very grateful for all those people because this subject matter, um, there is a ministry level to this. And whatever you decide as far as just the the food you eat uh, side of this, there are other layers to this. This, this is so many different layers. And I'll just tell you, Nino, I think this audience is going to want Cameron back many times because of the the overlap into world events and this larger social conversations that are going on. This isn't going away, and it's, it's a moment that's building. And I think we all will, down the road, be appreciative of the work that Cameron and the others have done uh, to bring us this, to at least give us the alternative, swimming upstream against the uh, current. Um, and I will say this, Cameron, I'm sure you would say it too. What you would have produced in 2017 or 18 would have no relationship to what you actually are at now. It took that many years of sifting and working and thinking and researching to end up with the quality of the product you have now. I was personally uh, very taken aback by just what a quality job you did. Everybody needs to go see this and, and go online. Buy a ticket now because some of those theaters are going to fill up uh, in some of the they places. Can, where they can go here to buy, the, to buy the ticket. Yeah. yeah no, no, it's Christ. Right go, to, right go, to go to Christ Go to Christ .com real quick, Nino, on the uh, on the screen share here. I think that'll be helpful. That's the that's the Kickstarter or the Indiegogo. I'm sorry, which is another crowdfund platform. We use we we carried over after the Kickstarter closed. We carried over into Indiegogo, but they're both they're both closed out. Um, Christ Spear SC. Yeah, there you go. Dot com. <laughs> boom. So that's where you want to go. Right and boom it's right there in el paso but you can i mean it's all over the country and there's your two dates march 20th and 24th um ma many of the oh, you know the, ma the, the major cities of america too it's like you know i'm in los angeles right now because we have funny enough we have our uh red carpet premiere tonight we're doing a little red carpet just to bring some oh, friends beautiful. together some people yeah so that's happening tonight but um here in here in uh, la there's uh, there's so many screens it's all over the place well, let me let me get this up, man. I want to get this up tonight. I mean, we don't have any, okay. it's a March 14th. We want everyone out there March 20th, correct? March 20th. March 20th. And, and March 24th, correct? And yep, yep. And I want to say too, you know, I think it's worth saying for your audience, you know, uh again, they're gonna have so many questions. They're gonna, they're gonna <laughs> their wheels are gonna be spinning on this, I know, uh, with some of the conversation we've already had. Um, but just you know, for what it's worth, again, we 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 bought this back from Netflix. We are trying to keep this story true. Along the way, we were spied on. We had to we had to hire a, a, we had to fight we had to hire a, a private investigator who does FOIA, Freedom of Information Act investigations, what? to find and 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 prove that there were people, uh, you know, following this. Um, so this is mostly. a huge conspiracy. Um, both we, we had apartments ransacked. Uh, we had my, my, you'll see. So I, again, I don't want to take the thunder from the film, but you'll see, you'll see What's the level of right here. Exposing unforgiving truths. Joaquin Phoenix. Exactly. So Joaquin, um, is a big animal rights advocate. Uh, you'll notice if you watch his acceptance speech for the Joker, he brings it up pretty blatantly there. Um, Joaquin, uh, Two or three years ago now, <laughs> when he won the Joker, um, both at the Golden Globes and at the Oscars, I was living here in L.A. I, I was living out of my van, you know, in L.A. Off, you know, I, I traveled around, but I this is where movies are made. Kip moved down here at that time, and uh, yeah. a lot of the connections are here. So we 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 positioned ourselves here. Long story short, um, 
Joaquin and his family have been through a whole journey, but she's a big, you know, uh, lover of Christ. And, uh, she, he particularly was, um, uh, a big, you know, animal lover his whole life. And there's a whole backstory with all of that. And when he won the Joker and the Golden Globes, um, he actually, instead of going to do some of the after party stuff and all that Hollywood stuff, he actually would go support these activists outside of this uh, pig slaughterhouse in oh, interesting. Um, in L.A. that was doing some really, really inhumane practices. And so there's there you can look it up in the news and stuff, but he's like in his, you know, attire and everything and just shot over there. It's all dirty and everything, but he he shot over there to support them. And I just so happened to catch him. Um, when I was there at one of those, uh, right, right after that, I believe it was, you know, the week after the Oscars or something like that. And we got to talking about this topic and, um, you know, he was very open to it. And funny enough, he played Jesus uh, years ago in a, in a rendition. It's most people missed it, but it was, I mean, it was a story. guy. <laughs> it goes yeah, from yeah, like yeah. Jesus from to the Joker. From the Joker and Commodus, the uh, the you know basically the Caesarian uh, ruler um, in Gladiator, the movie Gladiator, he won like yeah. best villain for that. But anyways, um, he played Jesus in this this rendition of fo focused on Mary. But I talked to him about this topic, and he was deeply you know interested and moved, and um, he knew of the other films. He was actually uh, honorary executive producer of of one of the previous films. Um, and just so you know, too, again, people always say, oh, it's Joaquin Phoenix or Leonardo DiCaprio, because Leonardo DiCaprio was the honorary executive producer of Calspiracy. Um, but all that means, people are like, oh, Leonardo DiCaprio produced this, he funded it. And it does not mean that. Um, what happens is we're, when these films were put out into the world and the buzz started to spread, these people hear about it. And it's like a, it's like a, there's no funds exchanged, there's nothing. It's just, someone who allows for their name to be put on it. It's like getting a quote from someone at the beginning right, of a book, right. you know, it's, yeah. it's, that's all that it is. Same thing here. So essentially Joaquin saw the film. He really, really enjoyed it. He thought that it was really powerful and he, you know, gave us a full quote. Actually, this is just a piece of it. Um, but he's, you know, supportive of the film and you that's know, awesome that we're doing it. So. Well, it um, looks like I'm going to be going to cinema. I'll go see a little bit some more pretty yeah. soon. I'll be able yeah, to yeah. get it. You know, I'm going to go ahead and cut the podcast here. I want to get this up tonight. I got to get this up, but I got to send it to editing. That takes two hours. This yeah. was big. So you have me really taking a step back and thinking about this because I'm a big meat eater and I can't answer that question. Is there a spiritual way to kill an animal? I can't answer that, honestly. Yeah. So, well, so well, me. can I? I know how much more time do we have left? Cause I know we tabled that one piece of the conversation, but we could always save it for another one. If you want. It's, oh, let's it's, go. Let's, let's, okay. Hey, you know what, Cameron, let me just say this. I think that we're going to have to come back and do several bites at the apple here. And, you know, you can tell when I said that there's a lot of layers to this and Cameron is really a pro at it. Um, your audience is going to want to hear from Cameron again and again and other audiences in this community. And in fact, I would encourage all the hosts that uh, are all friends of yours and mine, Nino, that uh, uh, they need to have Cameron in there. Uh, in the months and years to come, uh, Cameron's going to become a very important uh, uh, person, a go-to person on a lot of different areas of subject matter. He's got some stuff that he's working on right now that, build on what's coming with this uh uh movie release and i think some of the stuff that's coming is going to be even more compelling this lays a foundation for a whole bunch of important conversations we have to have and i just uh you know with all the challenges uh just like what happened with sound of freedom uh both internally and externally within the, the production of that and it got shelved when when disney bought the studios that had it and then it had to be uh sorted out I wasn't happy with how it ended up getting released, but that's a, a different story. It's the people involved uh, that was their business. But here, uh, these challenges in both movies case uh, made it even better when it was finally released and the public got a chance to see it. Uh, you have a better product right now, Cameron, because you had to go through all of these different phases and you're going to be around 
uh, I think you're, you know, you'll you'll look back fondly, <laughs> having got the time to just be in the van by the beach, as uh, difficult as those times were, because you're going to be a, a person that's in demand and on the move, on the roll, on these subjects. Uh, and I, I think your casual lifestyle is going to go to the go to the curb as it has over the last many months uh, because of the, the, the people that will be reaching out and needing to hear your perspective on these things. I will be. And I'm just so thankful, Nina, you did a, a super job. I love this audience and uh, big hat tip to you. Uh, you guys are all my heroes. This whole I just I got to think about what I'm going to name this. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> so, there's a one, lot, one, a lot here. One one thing I Christ, do, you know, Christ Spiracy. I, I people need to know where to find it. Get it right to the header in Christ, the uh, in search section. Uh, Christ Spiracy. Christ Spiracy is a very challenging name in and of itself. It it catches your attention, and I do want to address that because people just I can even close out with a couple things that I just want your audience to hear is um you know Christ Spiracy the way we came to that name because I mentioned when we first started this it was named something else um but the reason why we landed on Christ Spiracy you know a lot of people a lot of people hear that name and we're getting comments left and right you know people immediately assuming that it's like uh blasphemous or sacrilegious or we're trying to say Jesus didn't exist or it's anti-christian it's not at all it's the complete opposite this is a very very pro Christ film um the reason why we named it that is obviously just because of the previous films, Cowspiracy, Seaspiracy. It was an obvious, oh, Christspiracy. It was it was really not much more than that when we first thought of it. But then we were like, oh, wow, that is powerful. That stops you in your tracks. But just so people know, like we go all deep into etymology in this film, which is the study of words and the deep root meanings. And therefore, I took the time and said, well, what does Christspiracy actually mean? Like, what's the etymological root of that? And funny enough, you know, Christ, it means Messiah or anointed one. That's a Greek thing. But then spiracy, most people don't know, you know, for all the conspiracy theorists listening to this, the word conspiracy, what it really means etymologically is con, the, the, the prefix is with or together. Spiracy is spirare. It's, an, it's a Latin term, which means breath. Or respir like respiration, inspiration, mm -hmm. spirituality, right? It's the breath. Yeah. So conspiracy, conspiracy just means to breathe together. What and you know, so it's like a unifying thing. So you can conspire for bad, which is what most people are trying to uncover these days. But the the people of the world who are trying to make the world into a better place can conspire for good. You know, it, it can be used both ways. So in a way, Christ spiracy just means the breath of Christ or the word, which is really what we're trying to do. We're trying to talk about the words. That's the particular thing. There were words that Jesus spoke in the temple on, uh, on Palm Sunday that have been translated one way for millennia. But that's not what he said. He said something else, and we proved it with an uh, Oxford uh, hermeneutic uh, professor in real time to where she even had an aha moment and had wow. never seen this before. And that's the big crux of the film that that hinges on the bigger narrative and the world events and where we are right now. Um, and then the last thing that I want to say, uh, too, just for all of your listeners, is I'm sure your listeners are predominantly probably conservative uh, Christians and everybody. Yeah, that's the, I mean, these these type of videos do the biggest. So, yeah, yeah. I, mean, uh, so and, I'm, and I'm, I assume that <laughs> there's going to be for every for if anyone if any one of these people has made it this long to hear this part, yeah. I'm sure there's going to be the people <laughs> that are going to be like, who's this liberal whack job guy that's pushing this alternate, you know, extreme liberal agenda and this and that and yada, yada, yada. That is not me. I was raised with conservative values in the South. I'm from Augusta, Georgia, uh, the deep South, where the Southern Baptist Convention was founded. Um, I still hold those values true. I'm a, I'm a little more apolitical myself these days because it all gets pretty uh, murky, you know, as I think a lot of us feel. But my values lie on the conservative spectrum. And to me, I just want to say this issue with uh, like – if we just stay, stayed alone, you know, like Juan said, with our food system and the humans involved, if we just talk about that, we're talking about a massive, massive humanitarian crisis and issue here uh, involved with this. And if you're someone who does have conservative values, this is something that you need to be asking yourself because, you know, out of these values, let's just start with small government and, and taxation, right? In the agriculture industry, 64% of public funding goes to animal agriculture, whereas 0.04% goes to plant agriculture. And why wow. is that? Why that. is that? 
because it's so expensive and unsustainable to do it the way that these people are doing it in these big industrial systems. 99% of all animal products are factory farmed. And I think most of your viewers, even if they are meat eaters, would agree that they'd rather not have yeah. that. Uh, right. 99% of the world's animal products are factory farmed. I think if anybody saw how slaughterhouses ran, I think they would stop eating meat. I've, I've only seen glimpses of it, and it queezes me out. I get sick. Oh, it's rough. It's rough. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, no, let's okay. just let's, let's stop right here. This is good. Trust me. I'm just saying I, I, all I yeah, yeah, all I wanted to say is for the people out there who have conservative values and who are curious or wondering or are or, or nervous about this being some other agenda from the other side of the aisle or whatever. I'm telling you this is an this is this is a a piece of information and a question, a, a thought path that you need to be considering because it does align with all your values. Liberty, justice, nuclear family, uh, all the pieces pro life, but just for other, and you know, what, how, as far as you want to go with it, it aligns. So that's the questions that I had asked myself too, coming from that worldview. You got it. And, and right, let me thank this, you so much, Juan. Thank you so much. Dr. Juan, Dr. You, Nino, so much. Uh, you know, this he doesn't tell no. you the way okay. you're supposed to think. This movie gives you information, and he asks honest questions, and lets the listener have to do the mental gymnastics. Uh, don't feel like you're going to get preached to or, you know, throttled that you just got to be this way. I thought the, the way you approached it, Cameron, um, this was hard subject for me to have any interest in. And I was very pleasantly surprised at the, the way you did it. I'm looking forward to getting feedback from, from the folks that go see it. Nino, I know everybody's going to be well served. Thank you so much, Cameron, for coming. you know, for taking on, uh, you know, a subject matter that I know the audience is probably was rolling their eyes when they began. They're probably some of them still rolling their eyes. Go see the movie. I think you'll feel well served that you did. All right, guys. Thank you.